Um, okay, I'll get started. Um, hello. <laughs> um, so, my name is Lisa Evans. Um, who am I? I first study, studied physics and astronomy and um, then ended up working in 3D animation and became a tech artist in games. But because I had that science background, I kind of naturally gravitated towards more serious games. Is everyone here interested in serious games? Yeah? Because um, it's, yeah, they're awesome. Um, and then um, I started doing a PhD actually about six years ago and I'm just finishing now um, in that area but also working part-time at ICRA, which is the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, um, on a citizen science project, which we've ended up introducing game design elements into. And so I've gotten very interested in the way that game design and citizen science complement each other or how they can be kind of merged together. It's actually a very natural fit, so that's what I want to, be, want to talk about. Um, ICRA is a joint... Um, project between Curtin and UWA, which was established to support the Australia's um, application to host the Square Kilometre Array, which is um, basically the largest uh, radio telescope that's ever been built. Um, it's got a, um, a... I can't remember what you call it now, I've gone blank. But the size of it is the size of, of a, an entire Square Kilometre, and it's thousands and thousands of um, antennas all kind of working together. And part of it is in Western Australia, part of it will be in South Africa. Um, it's um, out in the Murchison region near um, Jinjin. And one thing that ICRA does to help support that is what's called data intensive astronomy. So the square kilometre array is one of the many um, kind of projects that just generates a massive, massive amount of data. And so astronomy, a lot of astronomy into the future is going to be about processing enormous amounts of data using supercomputers and so on. And so ICRA has a relationship with a supercomputer in Perth, um, the Pawsey facility. And that's one of the reasons why ICRA does citizen science is because we need people, we need more brains, more eyeballs involved in doing this work. So I'll get into why. Um, so what is citizen science? So does everyone here, um, is everyone familiar with citizen science at all? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's about, there's a lot of science now that needs extra people power and it needs extra brains, extra eyes, people in places that are hard to get um, or hard for scientists to go to, go back and forth to, to collect data. If there are people there who can collect data, then that's awesome. Um, and it's, Citizen science has always been a thing, like all throughout the history of science has been, a, a lot of scientists, when you go through the history of science, they didn't go and study it at universities, they were just people, kind of interested amateurs who just travelled around and made observations. They tended to be quite privileged people who had the resources to do that. Um, and there's been a lot of projects in, you know, in Australia's history, there was a large botanical project where, because the Europeans came here, they didn't know what types of plants there were in Australia. They got people to gather botanical um, samples and, and just create collections of them. So it's, citizen science has been going on for a very long time, but obviously in today's environment where you have the internet, you've got mobile technologies, people can design tools to really formalise citizen science, make it easy to get involved in, make it easy to create huge um, databases of of um, data and so on. And so right, so now there's a big push to create these tools and to establish these projects and work out how exactly we're doing this, which is really exciting, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about the different types of citizen pro science projects that there are. There's this um, fairly standard typology. Um, contributory citizen science is where um, volunteers are mainly just collecting data and they might have a little bit more involvement like um, helping to analyse it and might be involved in communicating results to their communities because people who are in citizen science kind of become ambassadors for that project they, they, or um, champions for that project in their communities which is a good way to engage the general public in science. Um, but then there's more collaborative projects where citizens help to design the study and they help to draw more conclusions from the data but then at the other end, there's co-created citizen science, which I find really exciting, 
where citizens are involved right from the beginning when they're developing research questions, generating hypotheses, also helping to write up the publications that get published and um, recommending further research. And the, the good thing about co-created citizen science, I mean, it might even be more kind of radical than that. There's other types that are referred to as you know, peer to peer citizen science, where it's basically just communities deciding we have a problem we need to solve. We'd like to use science to solve it. And then scientists are more brought on as consultants. And it's really the, the community that decide we're doing this. And um, there's been examples um, for instance, um, after Fukushima in Japan, where it was just you know, Japanese citizens um, distributing Geiger counters and just taking recordings of radiation levels um, just because they, they felt the need that they needed to do that. And they had the power to do that and they developed tools to do it. Um, also in uh, uh, black communities in the south of um, America, there's... Um, some examples where communities were being affected by um, hog farms, where the, um, there's these massive lakes of just effluent that come from these hog farms, where the wind can kind of aerosolize all these um, microbes and bacteria, which then get blown over the communities nearby and that affects their health. And then because obviously we don't have great diversity in, in science and in you know, STEM areas in general, um, Communities like that don't necessarily get the attention that they need from scientists. So they might, they, there's examples of them creating basically citizen science projects to gather the data about their, how it's affecting their health. And then that's been used to actually win lawsuits against these um, hog farms and get the laws changed to, um, to help to protect people's health and regulate the farming. And it becomes a way of actually organising around a, a social justice issue. So it's a great way to... Um, to really empower people because literally knowledge is power and this is a way of getting science outside of institutions into the community, empowering people through the use of that knowledge and I love that. Which is, you know, um, astronomy citizen science isn't really about social justice but um, it does help in terms of increasing diversity among the people involved in astronomy so that's a good thing. Um, just as some examples of citizen science projects, one of the big ones um, in astronomy is Galaxy Zoo. It was one of the earlier projects and it's been running for a really long time. Where um, in astronomy, we, this problem is just the amount of data. We have these massive surveys of galaxies and we need to answer a lot of questions about those galaxies before we can really do the science on them. And um, early on, a lot of these projects were about classifying them because there's standard ways of classifying galaxies so you can sort them into their different categories and then you can do the science on them. And so Galaxy Zoo was about getting people to answer questions about images of galaxies so they could be classified in that way. Um, and then out of Galaxy Zoo, um, there's actually de been developed a platform called Zooniverse, which allows different, um, different research teams to create more citizen science projects. So if you go to Zooniverse, you find a huge array of different citizen science projects that have been developed on that platform. And I think developing platforms is something that really needs more, um, more people involved and, and um, well, I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, some more examples, um, backyard bird count, and a little uh, goose egg there. <laughs> um, so that's an Australian uh, project for just counting and identifying bird species. They've got a big um, kind of a uh, a big push to count birds that's coming up later in October, which you can all join in on. Um, and it just helps to track the different populations of birds and how they're moving around the country and how they're being affected by climate change and so on. So there's a lot of bird watching type citizen science projects. And in general, citizen science has found its niche more in the earth sciences than in astronomy and so on. But there's lots of examples of other areas that aren't related to the environment. Um, and Frog ID is run by the Australian Museum. They've got a really good mobile app, which you can go out and record audio of different frogs. And again, it's just really useful to get, to collect this data that scientists can't necessarily be going out into the field and getting themselves. And so we come to AstroQuest, and I've got a video here. One of the, the most fundamental branches of astronomy aims to understand how the galaxies we see in the universe today first formed. Over the history of our universe, these galaxies have been shaped and sculpted by various astronomical processes, such as the birth of new stars, 
the production of cosmic dust, and through smashing into each other in colossal cosmic car crashes. As astronomers, it's our job to understand how all of this happens. The process of galaxies changing over time is called galaxy evolution. We observe cosmological fossils at different ages in the universe and try to piece together how and why they've changed from the Big Bang to today. Just as a particular species evolves over millions of years on the Earth, and we can see this in its fossil record, likewise, galaxies change over the 13.7 billion years of universal history, and we can see this by observing large numbers of galaxies out into the distant universe. To do this, we use some of the world's largest telescopes, observing vast areas of sky and measuring the properties of all of the galaxies that we find, like how many stars they contain, how many stars they're forming, and where they live. We then compare these properties to find connections which might unravel the forensic history of the galaxies that we see today. For example, do galaxies in the early universe form stars more quickly than ones that exist now? And do galaxies that live near each other contain more stars than ones that live on their own, and why? One of the first crucial steps in working out these properties is to measure the amount of light that we see from each galaxy at a very particular wavelength. This can provide unique insights into the composition of the galaxy that we are observing. However, there's a snag. Sometimes it's very hard to work out which light is coming from which galaxy. If the galaxy's in an isolated blank patch of sky, everything's okay. But the universe is jam-packed full of galaxies and stars. And as we look out into space, lots of these galaxies and stars overlap. And this is like looking into a dense forest and trying to work out which branch is attached to which tree. Now, to get around this, as astronomers, we've developed sophisticated software to identify which light is coming from which galaxy or star. We made really good progress, and the software works in a lot of cases. However, the human brain is still far better than any software at identifying complex shapes of galaxies and our computers still fail in a lot of sources. We find that these galaxies are incorrectly split apart into lots of different smaller parts, or two galaxies which are added together when they shouldn't be. So astronomers have to find where this software goes wrong and fix it all by eye. And this is where you can join in. As an astroquester, you will inspect galaxies in the distant universe and identify where our software has gone wrong in measuring their light. If it has, you'll help us fix the problem by telling us which light is coming from which galaxy. With newer and much larger surveys of galaxies, like WAVES, there's simply far too many galaxies for astronomers to fix on their own. So your skills will be vital in helping us understand the complex processes which shape our universe. <laughs> So I'll just um, open up the website. You won't be able to see it just for a moment. Uh, there's one where I've already logged in. OK. So this is um, the main part of the website where you are shown an image of a galaxy. Um, that's the actual image. And I can zoom in on that. And then this overlay shows where the computer guessed there was a galaxy. And so we have a little checklist on the side where you can look at it and say, um, is there a galaxy there, which there is. Is the galaxy covered by one coloured segment? It is. Does it cover the entire galaxy out to its edges? Yep, there's no overlapping objects in this one. And we also have different light channels down here. Oh, except they haven't loaded for some reason but you can see um, the light from specifically from the different telescopes in different wavelengths, which are all combined together into the composite image. So for this one, I would say, yes, that's all correct. And the computer got that one right. Hopefully I'll get... And, and then we, um, we show some good, cool results about it, the different properties. This is all based on the computer's guess. Um, and we, we don't update that until... Even if the computer got it wrong, we don't update it until a large number of people have looked at that galaxy and then we can recalculate all that data based on the average of their results. And so we've got this nice little graph here. It shows these are the different telescopes that we're getting data from, the different wavelengths that they are observing in. 
Um, three of them are space telescopes, which is really cool. Um, and then it shows you what different properties of that galaxy we can see from those different wavelengths. Um, we have this nice little timeline that shows that this is when the light left the current galaxy and all the things that have happened since then. And we can um, scroll all the way back and see where that is in relation to the Big Bang, all the way back here. And there's more results in here, which these are the ones that the scientists wanted you to see but we decided to hide those because they were freaking people out. Um, there's a lot in there. <laughs> um, hopefully if I go to, go to the next galaxy, it'll be a harder one. Okay, so this one again. Oh, there does seem to be a little extra. I can't quite see it on here. Um, so what we do then is we say, I'll just zoom in on it so we can see a bit better. We say, no, it's not all correct. And we use these little paint tools to fix it up. So here we've got it, the star tool, which automatically chooses a contrasting color. And I can use that to paint around where that little blob is there. And if there's anything else wrong with it, then we fix it up there. And then I can save that result. So if I go here, oops. Close all tabs. Okay. So that's the main kind of functionality of the website. Um, but we wanted to introduce game design elements because there's a lot of reasons too. So these are the reasons that we, we kind of see for introducing game design. Um, you, you tap into intrinsic motivation, it just makes it more fun. When something's more fun, people are intrinsically motivated to do more of it because they want to do fun things. Um, it increases the feeling of being rewarded, which we already know from research that ICRA have done, that people who get involved in citizen science, they're motivated by altruism, they really want to help, so they're already quite motivated, but, and they feel rewarded just by contributing to science, but we wanted to give them more ways to feel rewarded because they're doing very valuable work. Um, we want them to spend more time on the site completing tasks and come back to the site as often as, they, as we can get them to. But at the same time, there's obviously ethical issues with that. We don't want to draw on kind of the techniques used by gambling or, you know, more kind of the types of games that try to be as addictive as possible. We don't want to get people addicted to this, we, but we do want to, we want to get that balance where we motivate them to, to do as much of it as, they, as we can get them to. Um, and this picture here is actually from Galaxy Zoo, and it shows the distribution of the amount of work that different people have done on Galaxy Zoo. And so the amount of data that's done by, um, by the really heavy users is up in the top left corner and on that left-hand side and along the top. But then down in the bottom right-hand corner, we can see a lot of work is also done by people who just fly by and just do a few galaxies and leave, as long as you can get a lot of people to do that. Um, but obviously, you know, it's hard to get large numbers of people onto any website. So if you can maximise that amount of data that you get from those heavy users, then that's obviously advantageous, as well as working on the number of people you attract to your, to your project. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. But the other thing is that I think game design features can help you to get better quality data. So we're worried about if we try to just reward people for doing lots of galaxies, then we're creating an incentive for people to just go correct, 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 correct. We're not necessarily getting them to take the time to really look at it, is, is this result correct? So we also wanted to reward people for taking their time and just spending time doing the work. Um, and the other thing that we thought we could do is that if you're using game design features, you can um, get an idea of the skill or experience level of users and then you can direct the more experienced citizen scientists um, to the higher priority tasks that you want done. So if you've got a batch of galaxies you specifically want done for a particular study, then you can, you, you've got an idea of you've got this community of, of more experienced users and you can target them onto those, those ones using some of the game design features that we look, we've been um, looking at. <coughs> But there are some really specific challenges to citizen science. And the big one that I've put up in the yellow letters is that the solutions in citizen science are completely unknown. So 
a lot of these game uh, kind of citizen science projects that lend themselves to gamification, I hate that word, um, they're kind of, they're like puzzle games, but they're puzzle games where we don't know what the solutions are. We can't reward people for getting them right because we're using the wisdom of crowds. We're getting, we want as many people as we can to give their best guess. We want them to give it to us independently of each other because if we, if they see other people's solutions then they get influenced by each other and we don't necessarily get their best guess and then we take the average of those and due to the way the wisdom of crowds works, the average should be pretty close to the real solution. But we don't know currently what the real solution is. And even for scientists, you know, they can give you some pointers on how to arrive at it and how they arrive at, at their solutions, but they don't know. Nobody knows <laughs> what the solution is. You know, you, there are galaxies that, well, there are images on this um, website where you don't know if something's a galaxy or a star and you'd have to look at more wavelengths to actually work that out. And it, takes a lot of time and scientists can't just look at it and know either. Um, also the people, the citizen scientists that we're getting involved, they're not experts but we need accurate data from them so how do we do that? How do we kind of train them up so we're getting really accurate data? How do we design features on the site to make sure that the data is accurate? Um, we also need citizen scientists to approach every problem from, with diverse strategies. We want them to come up with their own way of solving this problem because the more diversity we have in the strategies that they're using, the better the data is going to be. So we can't just reward one set of behaviours. Um, and also, it's very repetitive work. So even though people are mo motivated by altruism, we do need a variety of different rewards to maintain engagement in different types of people. Um, and so when you're developing game features for a citizen science project, then you're using iterative development, which most people here will be familiar with. But there's this, another little um, group involved in that iteration, which is the scientists. So you're not just having game developers developing features and getting players to test them and provide feedback. They've also got to run the game development features past the scientists. They've got to run the results from the players past the scientists. And there's this extra level of iteration going on there. Um, and that comes from a paper that's actually been written on one specific um, game-like citizen science project, which I'll talk about later. So we went through a few different iterations, but I want to just stress that when the way these projects work, you get, um, you know, ICRA applied for a grant for a citizen science project, and you pretty much have to define the whole project when you're writing the grant proposal. So it was all kind of set in stone how it was supposed to be developed, and they didn't really think about putting game features into it at all. We just happened to find that one area of the project came in massively under budget, so we had a bit of extra money and we could iterate over it a few times. So it evolved a little bit naturally to add a few features. But it wasn't designed from the beginning to have those features and it's become quite clumsy trying to add more features to it because, yeah, it needs to be designed from the ground up. Um, and that's one thing is that I would really like it if we can get game developers involved in more citizen science projects when they're writing those grants so that they can actually leave room to do this type of iteration. So in the beginning, it was just designed that in a way that it would just have trophies and like a, you'd, you'd get rewards for particular things. They didn't really specify what and you'd have a little trophy, trophy shelf you could go to and it'd just be like different types of telescopes or something. Um, so then I had to really, when I was brought on, I had to really think about, so what are we rewarding? How are we going to reward it? What effects is it going to have on the data? And then I went to a gamification workshop at a citizen science conference and we kind of realised what we really needed was some kind of a quest system. But we, you know, it, it's, you kind of have to work out what, does, what do quests mean in this context. Um, and then we came up with the name AstroQuest. So basically we decided it was just a way of chunking up the work. So you do five galaxies and then 10 galaxies and then 20 galaxies. But we'd also kind of um, level people up. So we'd start them off with galaxies that were closer to us, which means you're looking, they're more, the light, was emitted more recently. And the images should be clearer, the galaxy should be bigger on the image, um, and also ones where the um, algorithm has only guessed one or two segments, which are the easiest ones to solve. And then as people complete more of the quests, then we start giving them galaxies that are further away, galaxies that are smaller, galaxies with a lot more segments involved. And ones with a lot more segments um, a lot of the time there's like a massive star nearby that's just completely interfering with the image. They're very tricky ones to solve. 
Um, but we couldn't design quests that would take into account the entire sample of galaxies because you know, we, we kind of designed ones that um, covered the first 500 or so galaxies that you do. But there's 60,000 galaxies on the website currently and we're going to be putting up many, many, many thousands more. There's millions that eventually they need to do, like at least you know, a couple of million that they would eventually like citizen scientists to look at. So we couldn't really design a, this quest system to cover all of those galaxies. So then we thought, well, we need other ways to motivate people to keep going once they've finished all these kind of introductory quests. So it was really adding extra things, uh, achievements, so when you've done um, the first 500 galaxies, you kind of rewarded through a quest system, but as you keep going, an achievement for 1,000 galaxies, and then 5,000 galaxies, and 10,000, and so on. With the biggest one we've got currently is 50,000, which um, our top user will hit at some point. Um, and also leaderboards, which are a very powerful motivator, incredibly powerful. And they also, um, they provide a sense of community, which, um, because they, ICRA had made the decision not to have forums, which need obviously community management and moderation and so on. The leaderboards are basically the one way where you see what other people are doing and plus you get the competitive motivation from it. Um, and then in a future iteration, what we would like to do is use the quest system to um, create kind of weekly and monthly quests uh, so that we can, so people who finished the initial quests then are given further quests that we can use to prioritise, as I said, um, batches of galaxies that we want our more experienced users to do. So I'll just, um, that was just an introduction to them all and I've just got a few slides kind of showing that more explicitly. So the quest system that we've got, it's, um, this is how it looks at the moment and for each of these different little quests that you complete, it unlocks a different observatory and you can get information. So that first one is called um, Wordy Yaoi or something, I can't actually remember exactly what it's called. Um, but it's, a, it's an Aboriginal observatory that's tens of thousands of years old. And then as we go through it, we kind of go further through the history of um, astronomy. Um, and as I said, the levels, as you complete the quest, you level up and you, we, this one, you're at the level of time explorer. As you continue, then ultimately you become a time lord. We couldn't really escape that one. <laughs> so that allows you to look the furthest back in time because you're getting the more distant galaxies. Uh, and then the achievements. So we've got achievements there for the number of galaxies that you've done and how frequently you come back to the site and things like that. We've got our leaderboards here. As you can see, the top user has so far, when I took that screen cap, had done 42,587 galaxies, um, which I just, that just blows me away. It's very humbling that people will actually spend that amount of time on one of these sites and put that amount of effort into it. And we've also got on another tab the time that they spend inspecting. So I think that um, top user has done at least five days worth of effort just sitting there using the Galaxy tool itself because that's the part where we take, where we time them. It's not even how long they spend on the website. And yeah, the, the leaderboards are incredibly powerful and I've, I've used the website with um, a group of year four students and then when I pulled up the leaderboard and I showed them where they'd gotten up to in the leaderboards, they were just like, wow, and then they wanted to just keep going with it. So it's amazing how motivational it is. But these are like really stock standard basic kind of game design features and we have thought about other ones that we'd like to do and as I said, the weekly and monthly quest and these suggestions come from Matt Diet, Brendan Reagan and Lisa Rye who we've worked on on a lot of this. Um, it's also been suggested that instead of using the quest system, what we really should have done is have an XP level which would be an easier way to span the entire sample of galaxies and to just have criteria which unlock more of those galaxies as your XP increases. Um, and then we don't need to have all those little hexagons for different groups of gal galaxies and so on. You could just have like a progress bar or something that shows this is where your XP is at. And um, yeah, so that probably would have been a better way to go. Um, it would provide continuous motivation and give us that information about who are the more experienced and skilled users. Um, other future iterations we've thought about is the No Man's Sky um, approach of if you're the first person to see one of these galaxies, you can give it a name, obviously profanity filters and all of that. Um, but that really encourages that sense of exploration because you actually might be the first person to ever have looked at that galaxy, not just on the website, but anybody on the planet. You could be, could be the first person to look at it. And I think that's a really good thing that we should be highlighting on the website. Um, and also 
the idea of Easter eggs where if you click next galaxy instead of seeing a galaxy, you might see a space probe or an astronomical object or Santa Claus or something, and then that adds to a collection, you get kind of a Pokemon effect. <laughs> um, so we've got all kinds of other ideas and it kind of depends on fitting them into the time we've got left for our grant and so on and the budget that we've got left. But obviously if anyone has any other um, ideas, just, you know, you know, meet me and, and let me know if you <laughs> desperately got an idea that you want us to know about because we might work it into this project or a future one. And if anyone obviously wants to, is interested in consulting on this type of stuff, we're interested in getting people's names and contacts for future projects. Um, and so I've got a little video with some results. So um, on the left hand side, this is a gal the, um, where the computer algorithm originally guessed that galaxy was and obviously it's, it's not encompassing all of the light from that galaxy. On the right hand side, as I move that threshold down, it's creating kind of a heat map of all the users results combined. So the really bright red part is where most people guessed that the galaxy is, but as I've increased the threshold, I've increased more and more of the work done by different users. You can see it covers the galaxy better. And this one, the computer didn't notice, the, the algorithm didn't notice that there were these little orange blobs and it's included those in the light for that galaxy. But then as we look at the user, combined user result, we can move the threshold down, get to a point where it really nicely just cuts out those little orange blobs. And then we get a much more accurate picture of what that galaxy, what light is coming from that galaxy. So it doesn't work as that well on all of them, especially galaxies where we've got two that are kind of merging and interacting and it's not clear which one is the galaxy kind of in the center of that picture or, and so you might get 50% of the users going, oh, this galaxy is the one that I'm supposed to be coloring in. And the other 50% might say, this one's the one I'm coloring in. Then the threshold doesn't really work very well. So we've got to sort out how do we either process that data to, um, to get the result that we want or how, what instructions do we give users so that they solve that properly. There's a lot more work to be done on those kinds of examples. Um, and also, I'll just have a slide here on evaluation because um, you know, I gave a talk a couple of years ago about evaluation in serious games and I just like to spread the gospel of evaluation because it, you can make serious games that are supposed to do something but um, unless you actually design an experiment to work out is it doing that, then it might not be working the way you designed it to. So we originally evaluate, um, designed a lot of evaluation against our um, Icarus citizen science goals, like we wanted to know which segments of our audience are using us request. Are we really kind of just um, picking up people who are already really confident in their ability to help and really already know a lot about astronomy? Or are we getting some people involved that might not be in those segments? Um, are they, if we are getting some of those people, are they becoming more engaged in astronomy by using it? We, want to, we have designed an experiment to look at what activity on the site is linked to greater engagement in astronomy and also um, whether those people are getting better at adjusting galaxies the more they use it or are they just kind of giving us crap results and then continuing to be crap all the way along, which um, is an important thing to know. But because we kind of um, added game features as we went along, we didn't originally plan or budget for evaluating the game design elements. So again, that's a reason why if you want to get involved in a citizen science project, to get involved early and to plan that evaluation. So, and there's a huge gap. I've looked in the published research about which, I wanted to find out what kind of game features improve citizen science data. And there really isn't a lot of published research about it. So it would be really awesome if there's any kind of um, academic type people here doing um, game studies. This would be an area, a really good area to look into um, and, and help to guide citizen science researchers in what game features they should be using. Um, and so I just started to highlight some other citizen science projects that have used um, kind of game design philosophies. And iWire is a brilliant one that everyone should go and look at. Um, basically, it gives you a series of cross-sections of a human brain. And they, obviously, they have a computer algorithm that will identify a particular neuron on that cross-section. But then they have to look, kind of look through all the cross-sections in a stack and say, well, this blue bit here belongs to this neuron. In the next cross-section up, where is the extent of that neuron? And in the next cross-section up, where is the extent? And then as you go up and down the stack, you build a kind of 3D model of that neuron. And this is like super cool. <laughs> it's really awesome. Um, and they have game design features in there. Um, I didn't look, I didn't kind of 
list off all of them, but one good thing they have is um, real-time chat and people help each other out and they do these challenges together as teams and things like that. So that one has been really, really successful by integrating game design features. And an older one is called Fold It. Um, that has had some um, publications that have come through about how they've used um, game design and, and approached it as a discovery game, a science discovery game. So Fold It is about looking at proteins, which are these incredibly long molecules. And in nature, they kind of fold themselves up in, in particular ways, which all depends on the structure of the molecule and the chemical and electrical properties of it, how particular parts of the molecule attract each other and other parts kind of repel each other. So there's a, a particular way that proteins will fold themselves. And it's one of the hardest problems in biology. And um, through Fold It, they found a way of training non-scientists to work out how these proteins fold themselves. And, you know, they create ch um, challenges to do and so on. And they've worked on things like an Ebola vaccine and AIDS vaccines and cancer treatments and so on. And they've, they're actually saving lives by playing this game, which I love. <clears throat> and a more local one is called Quest a Game. They explicitly have turned it into a game. They've got a mobile application, you go around and you take photos of different um, plants and animals that you see around the place. You can identify other people's sightings as you, they've got an in-game currency called gold and you earn gold by doing all this work. You can create competitions, you can run head-to-head -head challenges and so on. And I feel like in, it's almost like a Pokemon Go for science, you know, but, and I, I love how these, um, these types of applications, it's not like um, AR where you've got, um, it's basically just reality. It's not any kind of extension on reality, but it's, in, it's encouraging you to look at reality, the real world, and observe it in more detail, which I love. And there's a website, um, it's just citizensciencegames.com, where they actually have a really good list of um, game-like citizen science projects, which will be adding AstroQuest 2 in the future. Um, so uh, if you do want to get involved in citizen science projects, um, there's, a, there's a body called Australia, uh, the Australian Citizen Science Association, uh, which you can get in touch with. They have a conference every couple of years. Um, there's, a, there's hashtags like hashtag citizen science. Going to Zooniverse is a good way to find a huge range of citizen science projects and just sign up for them and do them and think about what games can add to these projects. And also, I'd love people to think about what platforms we need to facilitate kind of gamified citizen science. Can we build a platform where just kind of automatically you can just hook into leaderboards and all that kind of thing much more simply. Um, so then, you know, for the, those basic features, the, t the um, researchers don't have to think too hard about them. And as I said, try and get in touch with teams that are currently in the planning stages because it's so hard to add this stuff later on. And a lot of citizen scientists, they don't really see the value of this yet. So I just really love to kind of get that um, networking going on between game designers and citizen scientists to try and educate both sides about, you know, what they can do for each other. And um, one thing I didn't mention earlier on, I mean, th this whole thing of if we can appeal to people who like to play games, people who like to play games are natural puzzle problem solvers and puzzle solvers. They, they're just attracted to solving problems. And science has, you know, the biggest problems that are facing us currently are being, have to be solved through science. That's our tool for solving those problems. And citizen science is a way of getting whole communities together to solve those problems. So if we can draw on people who enjoy playing games and appeal to that side of them, then that's a really powerful way to help get those problems solved. That's what I feel. Um, so any questions? Yeah. Yep. Um, given that uh, the project is a project based with a high budget, if you were in the uh, absolute development stage, yeah. what, would, what would be some of the bigger changes you would make to um, AstroQuest? Um, well, obviously, so the main problem we've run into is that it wasn't built to have these features. So it was built to just be a website. 
Um, they used WordPress as a front end for it. It's really hard to just kind of nail extra features onto it and make it work and make them easy to deal with. We would have built it as a, you know, either design it from the beginning as a website that was supposed to do these things, as a web application really, and you know, a mobile application. It's terrible on mobile at the moment, don't even try. Um, yeah, that's the main difference that we would have made. Um, but also, a lot of people said, why didn't you just use Zooniverse? And I think the, the reason is that ICRA does their own citizen science projects and they have a history of doing it and they like to just kind of do them themselves. Um, in which case, yeah, it should have been built as a web application rather than a WordPress site. Um, and then we would have been able to do a lot more of this stuff and thought about those game features like using XP um, from the beginning rather than we kind of went into the quest system from originally thinking about trophies and having a trophy shelf. We could have thought about, yeah, more effective ways to do it if we just gone, we want to reward people, what's the best way to reward them and what do we want to get out of this system? Um, instead of, yeah, iterating over it and coming up with these ideas later on when we'd already spent a lot of the money. Yeah, that's what would have changed. <coughs> Any, anybody else? Yep. Um, you mentioned that there was no Yeah, I haven't. Like, the interesting thing is that we've, because we haven't really rolled it out, we haven't pushed it really hard to get lots of people yet, but we did some media releases when we first kind of decided it was out of beta. And it got picked up by some Italian astronomy group, and the media release was immediately translated into Italian. We got an influx of a thousand people from Italy, like, <laughs> right away. And so obviously they built some kind of a community but it's all in Italian. We get all these questions from them in Italian. And yeah, it's, it, and then it took off in Russia and I've had some, someone from, I think it was Azerbaijan and like it's, so that's kind of makes it hard to build those communities around these projects. But then with, there's another one that um, called Radio Galaxy Zoo, which one of the research, or a couple of the researchers at ICRA are involved in, where they ended up having localization done by their community. Um, so their website got translated into many, many different languages. And yeah, it gets hard to manage those communities, really hard. Anybody else? Yep. I guess are you planning to have a, I assume in the future, a data release of the, the science of the classified galaxies? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the really important um, kind of issues in citizen science is that you really need, people are contributing to your work, you've really got to then publish the results in a way that they can understand and, and just feed that back to them. So we do on um, the AstroQuest site, we've got an article about, um, because this one kind of evolved out of a previous uh, project called Galaxy Explorer. So we've got an article there that kind of summarizing the work that, that came out of Galaxy Explorer. And we do, um, a, as this data gets used, we do want to feed back that as well. And I mean, there's a real problem in science where, um, in, in scientific publishing, where people can't, people who aren't part of a university can't access scientific papers. And so, you know, you can run into issues with freely sharing scientific papers, but it's really, I think it's super important for citizen science to overcome that problem and be able to actually share the pub published papers and also have some kind of a more layperson's version of it that people can read as well. Yep. Yeah. You always need something new to get people to buy it again every couple of years. Exactly. Um, yeah, and we need ways of saying, look, we've just put up a new batch of 100,000 galaxies and we've, you know, creating incentives, you know, prizes or whatever so that people come back and do a big b batch of new, um, of new work on the site. So those are things that, yeah, we haven't had to approach yet. Um, with previous projects, that um, uh, ICRA had done one that was more on, it was one of those ones that use up your computer, your CPU cycles rather than needing you to be actively involved. That's fairly easy, like people just leave it running and they, they like seeing the results and they don't really stop using it. But this type of one where they have to be actively engaged, yeah, we have to have some way of getting them on board each time we've got a new data batch up there. So that's, yeah, a future problem to be solved. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Oh, thank you for coming to my talk. And if you
you want to talk to me? Um, I didn't put my contact details up, so um, I've got, but I've got business cards if anybody wants one. Thank you.